Hey, Dr. Newman here. Welcome back to History of the English Language. Today, in this video, we're going to talk about early modern English sounds and spelling. And more specifically, we're going to talk about one of the more significant phonological events in the history of the English language, uh, an event that took place over the course of a century or more, some say it's still happening, uh, called the Great, Great, Great Vowel, 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 Shift, 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 Shift. The Great Vowel Shift begins in around 1400-ish and is more or less complete by 1550 uh, in Standard English, in that which is to say in Southeastern England. Um, some, of the, some of the changes that took place in the Great Vowel Shift have not taken place completely uh, in, in Scotland, in parts of Northern England, and even uh, the, the, um, the, the characteristic Canadian about uh, indicates a vowel that has shifted less in Canadian through the influence of Scots English than in other dialects. Let's take a closer look. But first, let's talk just a little bit about spelling. One of the things that, that people notice when they look at older versions of English is that everyone spelled things funny. Now, if you take a Shakespeare class or you, take, you study Shakespeare in high school, chances are that you're reading a text that has to some extent been modernized, which is, isn't to say that has, it has been translated into modern English um, out of the early modern English. What it is to say is that uh, the spelling has been modernized because we do, as we'll learn in, the, in upcoming weeks, there was no such thing as standardized spelling before the 18th century. There was no incorrect or correct spelling people spelled things how they thought they should sound. So spelling displays more variation in early modern English than modern English. And sometimes the same word can even be spelled differently at different times in the same text. Um, so Shakespeare himself will spell the same word three different ways in three different places in one play. Well, when I say Shakespeare himself, of course, we don't know the extent to which Shakespeare had control over the text that we sur that survive. Of course, some of them come from folios, which were might have been recorded by other people, or from the first, or I mean, the quarto editions, or the first folio, which was compiled by several of the actors in his company after his death. So we don't know. We actually don't know how he spelled things. We don't have uh, his own manuscript copies from his hand. So. Um, this is on the left of the slide here is just an example of unmodernized early modern English spelling from the text of the first folio. This is the famous speech from Richard II, where John of Gaunt, Gaunt, Gaunt is giving this uh, famous speech that used to be used in uh, tourism commercials for the UK when I was a teenager. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered Eiffel, just kidding, it's sceptered Isle. You might notice that that the tall S there, which, you know, you'll, you might associate that with like the Declaration of Independence or something like that. That tall S used to be used um, more than the, the other kind of S, which if you notice in this text, the, what we think of as the S, the lowercase S is only used in the final position of a word. Um, so the, so word, so letter forms look different and there are some different other differences too. Word final E is more common. So, you know, the whole ye oldie, right? This is a kind of joke about that, you know, ye old shop or whatever. They sell shop with two P's and an E. This is an, kind of an authentic reflection of how spelling actually happened in, in, in early modern English. Another common difference is that in we don't have a clear distinction between the letters U and V because originally in the Roman alphabet, those were the same letter. And Printers at some point developed the convention to use the consonant form of that letter as a V and the vowel form as a U. In the same way, I and J originated as the same letter, but J came to be a specific consonant form uh, rather than a vowel form. Uh, so you sometimes see I for J. You'll also, in the same way, see Y for I, but you'll very rarely or never see Y in the final position um, of a word, that's almost always Y. Um, but you might see Y in the middle position. And in fact, in the modern uh, UK English, I think they spell, still spell the word tire, as in, uh, you know, the tire that you put on your bicycle or your ca car with a Y. Um, capital letters are used more frequently 
than modern English and somewhat more frequently than uh, in Middle English as well. Um, capital letters were not ne did not necessarily designate proper nouns or the beginning of a sentence. They might so it really depended on what the printer or the writer wanted to do. Um, and a lot of printers would just make any nouns um, uh, capitalized, which it, which became the standard practice in modern German. Um, punctuation in the early modern period, and we'll talk about this in the syntax video, but punctuation is stylistic rather than grammatical. Punctuation doesn't designate specific kinds of clause. There aren't precise rules for punctuation, but it was intended by um, when, when typesetters set text or, or writers wrote text to convey rhythm and cadence, not formal rules. And this is the kind of natural way that people um, use punctuation when they, as children, when they learn that it exists until they are corrected and taught to use punctuation correctly. Or in the case of my students, not taught to use punctuation correctly most of the time, but that's okay. That's what, uh, you know, grammar check is for. Let's talk about the great vowel shift. We've talked about spelling. Now let's talk about the sound. By 1600, the great vowel shift is largely complete. The great vowel shift was, I'm going to talk fast now. So you maybe want to slow it down, but I, I don't want this video to go on too long. This is a technical discussion and I can really get bogged down into it. And I want to keep it as um, simple and precise and focused and useful as possible. The great vowel shift was, was, is what's called a chain shift, um, which means a change in one sound pressures changes in other sounds, which change pressure changes in other sounds still. The great vowel only affected long vowels, and we'll, we'll review what that means. But yes, yeah, so a chain vowel is when one vowel sound changes, other vowel changes, so that generally there is a kind of pressure in language. And these are one of the internal factors in language change that we talked about at the beginning of the semester. Um, this is one of the internal factors. There is a tendency for vowels to shift so that they remain evenly distributed, so that there's more distinction between vowel sounds. Uh, remember that there's those competing uh, um, motives for language change. One is the principle of ease of articulation, and the other is the principle of ease of comprehension. And having more distinct vowels makes it easier to understand what, what somebody is saying, as in the example that I, that I uh, gave of um, pen, ink, pen, pen, pen in Southern English, right? Oh, what kind of pen? An ink pen, right? Um, the reason for the initial change in the great vowel shift. Why did this start? It's unclear. I've heard something about Flemish immigrants in London. I have no idea why it started, but once it started, it kept going. So what is it that happened? Well, um, it affected long vowels. The sound of a long vowel is held long for, we, this is a bit of a review from Old English. And you can go back to video nine, Old English Sounds and Spelling for, for, a, more, for a longer discussion of vowel length. But long vowel, in long vowels, the sound is held for a longer duration than short vowels. Rain and tree are long. Rat and trip are short vowels. Um, in modern English, a change in vowel quantity, long or short, always means a change in vowel quality. That is position, high, low, front, and back. So um, long, you never have a short range. Uh, that A sound is very rarely to never short in modern English. Um, so when we have one word form derived from another as sanity from sane, there's a change in vowel quality as well as length. Sane, sanity, clean, cleanliness, crime, criminal. You can see this um, back in the beginning of Van Gelderen's History of Old English on page 22. The seagull is saying a very long vowel. All right. <laughs> Changes in pronunciation from Middle English to Early Modern English, the Great Vowel Shift. Let's go to an example. In modern English, we would say, the knight took off his boots and ate cheese with a mouse. This sentence has all the, the long vowels in modern English. I, U, A, E, OW. That's a diphthong. Anyway, um, but in, in Middle English, we'd say, the Knecht took off his boots and ate a chaser with a moose. Right? E, O, A, E, U. Right? These are the, the five vowels. And, and these are similar to the five vowels in most European languages, including Germanic and Romance languages. It's sometimes called the five vowel system. 
Now, what happened? Um, how is it that Knicht becomes night? Boots becomes boots. Art becomes eight. Chase becomes cheese. And moose becomes mouse. We can see the A ah going to the A, right? E goes to I. E goes to I, as in E like it, no. I like it. And O goes to U goes to Ow, right? So the, the, ch the change took place over time. So in 1400, it's Knicht, Boat, At, Ches, Moose. In 1500, it's Nate, Boots, Boot, Atta, Cheese, U. So this one's done by now. 1600, Nate took his boots and ate cheese, mouse, mouse, mouse. It's almost like the Canadian one there. Actually, this is more like the Canadian one. By 1700, it's noit, the noit. And, and, that, and you can tell that sounds kind of Irish, right? Irish, right? That, that vowel sound there. Because in Ireland, that vowel shift hasn't gone all the way to where it has in standard uh, American or UK English. Um, eight becomes eight, and an eight becomes eight. It's hard to hear the difference there. Mouse, aus, mouse, mouse, right? So these are so it's a continuum. It, it went on, took place for a while. Some of the shifts happened quickly and completely, and some kept going for a while and didn't happen everywhere all the way, as in Canada, where mouse is still o, but only before a devoiced consonant. All right, so the, the great vowel shift is a chain vowel shift. The three long vowels, a, a, o, become a, e, u. Two long vowels, u and i, are pushed out and become diphthongs, i and ow. Um, that's pretty much it. That's the great vowel shift. Um, I hope this was helpful. If you want more detailed explanation, you can go to the YouTube channel of Dr. Jürgen Handke at the Virtual Linguistics Campus. Um, his YouTube account is at OER-VLC, um, if, if this is not enough detail for you. Uh, I have the feeling that won't be the case for many of you, but for a few of you, it might. All right, that's it for this video. Uh, see you next time when we talk about morphology.